Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I'm the heart-centered connector. And effective communication is at the heart of every connection I make. It also has to be the heart of every workplace for people to thrive. And that's why my company, GrowStrongLeaders.com, sponsors this podcast. We are on fire about getting our exceptional books and tools into the hands of millions of people in the workplace. And you can learn more at GrowStrongLeaders.com. Today, I'm really excited to have a conversation with a good friend and colleague, Fran Keo. Fran, welcome to my show. Great to be here, uh, Meredith. Good to see you on this uh, beginning of the new year. Yes, it's, it's exciting uh, to launch a new year. Before we jump into all the questions I have for you, let me introduce you to my listeners. Fran helps busy professionals build a better life so they have more time, more fun, and more freedom. I think that's something that all of us strive for, um, Fran. And over the years, what's so fascinating about Fran, Fran is she has reinvented herself several times from radio host to voice over talent to, and I love this, domestic goddess, <laughs> also known as the at-home mother of four. She's been an alpaca farmer yoga teacher, health coach, and is now a business life coach and speaker. And Fran brings, as you can imagine, a wealth of knowledge, personal experiences, intuition, empathy, and humor to her audiences and her clients. And she understands firsthand what it means to be burned out and feel stuck. And there are three words that start with an R that are integral to her work, resilience, resourceful, and reinvention. Fran and I discovered we have a lot in common because we both love the outdoors. We love watching and listening to birds. And here's something I want to learn from her more, and that is laughing a lot <laughs> because <laughs> I tend to be more serious. So we'll, we'll touch on that if we have a chance during our conversation today, Fran. I would love for you to kind of briefly describe this journey of yours, why so many paths and um, diverse pursuits that you've had. I just love the various challenges you've taken on over the years. I think it's just always been in my nature. Um, and I love synchronicity and um, serendipitous moments. And, you know, I have to, I have to um, place it in context. Uh, you know, when I was um, doing all these things, different things, not all of it, but most of it was, you know, being married and not being in the good place of not having to work. Um, I was, you know, we made the conscious to ch uh, choice to, uh, for me to be a stay at home mom, raise my kids, our kids. And um, I, always did something I always was wanting to be interested and involved in things outside of the home because I think it makes you so much more well-rounded um, plus it's important from my perspective I didn't want to end up being one of those people that when their children had gone off to school and gone left the home to say what am I going to do you know who am I now mm -hmm. um, I didn't want motherhood as important as it was and has always been to me, um, it was important that it didn't, just that alone didn't define me. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've always kept an open uh, place and, and I didn't have to follow a strict career path uh, anyway, financially. So that was good. In my earlier times, of course, I, I did. But um, I just have a, a curiosity, a natural curiosity that just doesn't quit. And um a love of life and a passion for learning. And I think that helped, you know, in that journey, I, I saw things that interested me, but there's still a connection 
between all of these things? I know it's hard to imagine sometimes, right? How does an alpaca farmer connect with being a speaker, a business coach? Well, actually, there's a lot of ways. If you're interested, I can explain that, but we, you know, we don't have to. Well, it is interesting um, to me, the alpaca farmer and what must have gone into that. I would love for you to share the connection because I know you work now with a lot of professionals, executives in the area of coaching. And there are some things that we're going to get into that relate to things you experienced yourself with Mm -hmm. that business. Mm -hmm. So let's do just take a minute to tie in. Where are those common threads? Uh, the common threads are, uh, well, first of all, as, as an alpaca farmer, I was a one-woman show with the support of my family, of course. So I did all the marketing, um, the husbandry, um, the, uh, I got involved in the fiber and making and selling that. I did, I mean, it was just, you name it, every single piece of it. And I did have a life a changing moment during that where I ended up in hospital for 11 days. So um I was doing too much. I think it's very easy to get so involved in what you're doing. And it's important to be committed and passionate, but, and I do work a lot with entrepreneurs also. So um, it's that point of overwhelm or not looking for the signs, not being Uh aware of the signs that it's sort of tapping at you, Um, you know, wake up calls, wake up moments. Um, So of course, those are huge. Those are huge factors in for most of us, you know, the overwhelm, um, frustration, uh, doing too much. The, the idea of overwhelm, I know, um, when we've talked earlier, many of your clients, if not all of them express to you this sense of overwhelm Mm -hmm. in terms of what, what they're feeling when you first start working with them. So talk a little bit about how you help them with that. What kinds of questions do you ask and what kind of a journey do you take them on to help them move from overwhelm to a place of better balance, peace, freedom, Mm -hmm. whatever you would want to call the uh, opposite of overwhelm might be? Well, I think there's lots of different factors involved in overwhelm for, for different people for different reasons. So it could be from a personal level, it could be something uh, business life. Sometimes it's both. Um, and it could be related to, uh, for let me give you an example. So somebody is overwhelmed with their workload. So what I will do is talk to them about peeling apart all the layers of, okay, let's take a look at the different aspects. And the common ones are things like, meetings. Meetings just take up way too much time. Okay. Uh, emails. I spend way too much time. I got all these emails. Uh, it just, it just keeps, it's like having um, a really untidy room that's just causing you frustration and it just, it, it adds to all the confusion and the sense of over, overwhelm. So you have to kind of do the Marie Kondo type thing, you know, sort of just minimalize or, or clean it down. But um there's no matter what the cause of the overwhelm is, usually it comes down to my six step, my six step guide for answering most of life's messiest questions, which is the same answer for everything, really. First of all, you've got to take a deep breath, well, several, just take some breaths and just for a moment, try to separate the emotions out of what you're experiencing right now. Just, just take a breath, separate it out and then start to look at the facts. What really is true that you know right now? What are the facts as you know them? And then when you look at that, um, you can start to see some kind of pattern or some some kind of answers. Um, Then you can start taking action and then let go. So surrender, you know. And that seems to apply to everything. That's the first thing you got to do because we just get so tangled up in these emotions and and the stress and and we just can't think clearly. You know, it's like hyperventilating. So that's always there, the the foundation. Um, 
if, for example, somebody is overwhelmed with um, emails and meetings. So the first question is, well, okay, do you have any control over the meetings that you, you attend? If they do, okay, is there a way that you could reduce some of those meetings? If not, can you go to the person who's hosting them? And especially virtually now, there's so many, so much of that. Um, are they all necessary? Well, actually, no, they're really not. Okay, rather than just not show up, how about you talk to the person that's hosting and say, do you mind if I, you know, maybe don't attend all of the meetings if they're not really relevant to me? You've got to ask, right? And emails, you can look at, do, do you just jump from email to email or do you have it scheduled from, you know, during um, parts of the day? So at this time I go look at my emails and so you've got designated time, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't, many people don't. Um, so, okay, and you can flag, there's ways to organize that. It's like organizing your drawers, right? Just organize it. And it's amazing how these seem so obvious, but until somebody actually can look at that and, mm -hmm. the, and it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a couple of things at work here. One is slowing them down yes. long enough to, and I love that taking a breath is the first step. I think that's so important. And I'd love for you to explain why does the breath help? What's happening in the body when we do take time to take a breath? Well, of course, this ties into my yoga teaching and training um, as well. Um, so you oxygenate the body. A very simple way, an example would be when we are stressed, we tend to breathe very shallowly, which we do as a culture anyway. So you're all up in here. And when that's happening, the tension increases. So imagine that you are being uh, concerned, you're being followed by somebody and you're trying to get your keys out and in the door to get in your house. And you're shaking because you're not breathing. You're holding your breath and you, you just lose control. You, you lose, uh, you know, the function. So once you start to breathe, you oxygenate the cells of the body. Everything starts to calm down. The adrenaline starts to slow it. And you can think more clearly and act more clearly. I mean, that's it put very simply. Mm -hmm. As you're talking, I was monitoring my own breath and noticing a difference in yeah. slowing down and breathing more deeply. Yeah. It, it is a, a physical sensation that there's a calming effect that's great. So I recommend all of my listeners do that, especially when feeling uptight. One of the things I think can get in our way when we're feeling overwhelmed, I think about this for myself and some other folks I know that, um, that get into this level of anxiety, let's say, or feeling stressed. Mm -hmm. And, and we, you and I both know a lot of that is based on the stories they're telling themselves about the situation. And so I'm curious as a coach, when you're working with clients and thinking of these high level folks who listen to my podcast and the things they're dealing with, those external elements are real. They feel very real. Mm -hmm. How do you help them differentiate those external things, pressures they're sensing in terms of the story they're telling themselves? You know what I'm saying? The differentiation yeah. there. How do you guide them so they, because let me just, before I have you answer, just thinking about when you're in the middle of feeling that, it's, it's really hard to step back yeah. and see the situation differently than the way you currently perceive it. And I think the more stress someone feels, the more strongly they feel that way. So how do you help them to take a step back to, to change their perspective and see it differently? Well, first of all, I think it doesn't help them usually to say nothing worse than being told to calm down. Mm -hmm. or chill out uh -huh. it, it, clearly it's not that simple but most of the time I'm not working with somebody who's at a crisis point at that moment in time it might be just compounded mm -hmm. must be over time. so I again I think the first thing you have to do it, it, it's a practice you, you and you have uh -huh. to ask yourself what's the worst that could happen now sometimes it's pretty serious and especially if you're a high-level executive 
you've got a lot work to, to deal with. But often the, the, I think sometimes people want to keep moving, moving, moving because they feel like they're accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. But actually, all that's doing is compounding. You've got to stop. And I don't have time to stop. Well, yes, you do. <laughs> you really, you have to. It's not a question whether you have time. Because ultimately, slowing down for a few minutes and getting in the practice of slowing down, you accomplish more anyway. Um, it's, I have found that most people, when they, when they think about this, and if they're willing to make the changes, that's the thing. You, you can meet a lot of it, resistance too. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not possible. I can't do that. I did have one executive that I worked with for a while who he was really getting in his own way. I mean, it was just clear. Um, he spent most of the time in our coaching sessions talking about how busy he was. And then he'd have to postpone and then he'd have to, you know, change the appointments. I mean, it, it, it just didn't flow at all. And it was so clear to me, he wanted somebody he could vent to, right? He wanted change. He wanted this big, broad, I want work-life balance. Well, really, <laughs> who doesn't, you know? But what does that mean? You've got to break it down into, this, into smaller pieces. Uh-huh. So first of all, I think it's important that you have to know that you are willing to stop for a minute, to oh, slow man. down for a minute. How bad is the problem? How much do you want to change? Are you willing to experiment and try and look at the possibilities for uh-huh. what change might mean? And also consider when every situation comes out, what comes up, what is the worst thing that could happen here? And usually the worst thing doesn't, I'm not going to say never because we know that's not true, but what we fear usually doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It often comes back to, like you said, the stories that we tell ourselves. So it's a long, slow process. And I tell anybody that I'm working with, it doesn't change overnight. Think about how long it's taken you to get to that point. So it's going to take some time to change the mindset around. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about fear because you've worked with so many folks and just all the work that you've done up to this point, you're aware of of what's behind fear many times. And I would love for you to talk about what you've observed is really the driving force when you sense someone is coming from a place of being fearful. What's behind that? Well, it's... I can't say there's just one thing. There's a number of different things. Sometimes Mm -hmm. one person, it's several of them. It's often, I think we're afraid um, of failure. That's a big one. Um, Afraid of being found out, you know, the classic imposter syndrome, afraid Mm -hmm. afraid to be found out to be a fraud. Um, So it's a lack of self-confidence. It's fear of um, succeeding sometimes. It's not always fear of failure. Mm -hmm. because what does that look like? And, you know, people often want change, but sometimes there's a comfort and security in staying where they are because it's so familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, you see this. And the idea of change is wonderful in theory, but they have no concept of what that looks like. So it's almost as if you have to help them create a new vision for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I work, there's a few people I, I've worked with and continue to work with who are at the point of retirement and they're terrified or if they're not terrified, they're really uncertain because they are so defined by their work and they've done it for so long. They have no, they've never spent the time to really vision on what that might look like. Mm-hmm. What does it mean when I'm not working anymore? That's a, that, I think that's a really big one for executives too. Yeah. Well, I was thinking also about <clears throat> behaviors like procrastinating yes, or requiring, mm-hmm. you know, perfectionism from mm-hmm. either themselves or those around them. Do you see fear being kind of the underlying um, driver in, in those kinds of behaviors? I, I believe that most of the time, sorry, I would just correct my my uh, screen keeps doing something odd, um, that 
procrastination is essentially another form of um, of um, fear, really. It's a per, I'm sorry, perfectionism. It, procrastination is a really at its heart is about um, perfectionism. And when I say that to people, they'll go at first. I might be really, and then they'll start to understand why. Because if something's not perfect, you have the excuse to stay there and keep working on it. Mm -hmm. When something, if you're always, nothing's ever perfect, especially if we're creating our own business, it's never going to be perfect. I want to have my perfect website before I launch my business. Talk about a major procrastination there. No, you don't. <laughs> Just get it out there. Just get the work out there. I think it's one of the things I really learned from a mutual friend of ours, uh, Walt Hampton, uh, who is my teacher um, and mentor. And that, that Every time, at first, when he he said that, I thought, oh, I wonder if that's really true. Fortunately, I'm not a perfectionist, anyways. I still procrastinate sometimes, but it's for other reasons, right? Um, and sometimes I think procrastination is about uh, maybe it's not what you really want to be doing. It's not your why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah. As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, yes, there are a number of different things. For someone wanting to get their website perfect, a lot of times it's because they want to procrastinate on doing other things in the business they don't find as pleasant. Yeah. Yes. And so that can be a reason <laughs> not to. But you're right. There are other things that we don't deem as important. Um, and, and so we put off doing them. But I think you're right. I think it can tie in oftentimes to the fact that it just doesn't spark us. You know, we aren't on fire about doing that. And I think when we face situations like that, for me, it is really helpful to say, okay, I'm going to take 15 minutes to get this one thing done that I've been putting off. Even if it's just clearing off my desk, it's having that block of time that I've allocated to yeah. it. And that can make a big difference in terms of feeling like I, I'm no longer putting that off, that I've given it the attention mm -hmm that it needs. And to me, this sort of ties in, Fran, with this concept of mindfulness that you've learned so much about from your yoga teaching and other, I guess, areas of information that you've absorbed or, or certifications. I would love for you to talk a little bit about what does mindfulness mean to you? How would you define it? And what does it look like when someone is incorporating mindfulness into the way they show up either at work or in the world in general? Well, first of all, I have to say that I'm not that good at it, <laughs> but I'm working on it. And that's, that's the key right there is, you know, practicing mindfulness is a lifelong process. I believe uh -huh. and, um, I'm more and more aware of it as I get older. One of the benefits of being older, right? Um, it's it's about being fully present in the moment. Like you and I are having this great conversation right now. And I I can sense once in a while I'll be slightly distracted by something, but I pull right back. And so I want to be in this conversation right now with Meredith, fully enjoying the moment. I'm fully present not thinking about what am I going to do when our podcast ends, you know, Oh, I've got this, I've got all these other thoughts going on in my head. And I think it, it just makes living every day so much richer and fuller. And one of the things that um, I just, re just finished the book by Akim Noak on um, uh, the moment mm -hmm. and, you know, creating mindfulness in a distracted world. And I loved, I loved the whole concept of it. And the, the last few paragraphs brought actually brought some tears to my eyes in a, in a good way it was a very poignant the idea that there are moments in our life that we if we pay attention to them we really are present in those moments how much they enrich our lives and make them so much more fulfilling and i i absolutely believe that and i was starting to think back even when i was a child i had a couple of memories from when i was really young things that stuck with me. I mean, obviously one prefers to have joyful moments or interesting moments, not, not the bad ones, but there are so many um, moments that go 
rushing by us that we lose Mm -hmm. because we're so busy planning or doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can spend time every day just being, even if it's a five or 10 minutes, um, that makes our our life richer. And it's just, and again, it's a practice. So Mm -hmm. the more we can do this, the better we get at it. It's just like exercising any muscle. Mm -hmm. I think, but I think the biggest part for me being mindful makes you a better listener, Mm. makes you a better partner, makes you a better friend, makes you a better coworker because you are in the moment and you are there for that other person as well as yourself. But it's all the other extraneous things that the catching that moment of the sunset, which is a, a cliche, but you know, or for us, it might be seeing a bird we've never seen before, you know? And if you're not doing that, you're missing half of life. Mm-hmm. So would you? Would you oh, I it? think, yeah, absolutely. And at, you were mentioning applying it to listening. I think that's such a, a key opportunity for practicing mindfulness because our brains, it seems to me these days are just wired for distraction. Yeah. You know, we have so many different inputs And so the idea of being fully with someone else and not allowing those distracting thoughts like you were talking about to enter your mind so that you're fully present with them. I think the more we can practice that, the easier it is to be more aware of each moment that we have. Um, I've, I've practiced this myself when my husband and I are out bird watching Mm -hmm. and we may not, you know, maybe it's quiet. I'm not even hearing them call much less seeing them move. And yet I remind myself I'm here in nature at this moment. And Mm -hmm. so whether there are any birds around us at this particular moment in time, I can just enjoy where I am. Exactly. You know, being with my husband, we don't have to be having, you know, a conversation. We can just be still and pay attention to everything that's happening around us. And I think there are just too many times, though, when we get distracted because there are so much going on. And I think just raising our awareness, like you're describing, so that we're conscious of these opportunities to be fully present with ourselves even. I think that's a hard time, isn't it, Fran? Do you find folks that you coach that are very busy, it, it's, it's challenging for them to slow down long enough to say, oh, I can take time for just me to mm, yes. be quiet. You know, and I think in that, I, I love what you said too about, you know, so you're sitting there, you're bird watching as an example, and you're not seeing any birds. Well, you could go down the path of, oh, I'm disappointed because we're not seeing any birds today. Or you can fully appreciate what's right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. you know? um, I was uh, just recently, my husband and I were at Bryce Canyon in, in Zion, but there was one moment at Bryce Canyon. I just remember it so vividly, just standing there. And at that moment in time, I think there was almost nobody else there, just looking at that vast expanse of absolute breathtaking beauty and feeling like I was hovering over it. I mean, you're right on the edge, you know, it was like, it almost Mm -hmm. felt like flying and just not thinking about anything else in that moment, just completely breathing it all in. It was just Mm -hmm. so glorious. And I know that that is what one of those bloom moments that Ahim Noak talks about, you know, and it will probably stay with me forever. Mm -hmm. But if I'd been too busy looking at my phone or trying to decide which stop to go to next, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have experienced it to the same level. Mm-hmm. Isn't as you're describing that fabulous experience, I'm just thinking about the people in our lives that we claim are important to us and, and how much attention do we give to them? Even when we're with them, are we fully present there? So I think that's such an important takeaway for people listening just thinking about this whole mindfulness, feeling overwhelmed at times and releasing those stories about what I've got to get done and just be where they are in in this given moment. 
because when you do, and, and that's a practice that I encourage um, clients to do also is to write things down and you might have three categories. So look at all your tasks that you have. What's absolutely non-negotiable that you and only you have to do, need to do, right? What's the gray area that maybe is not, you know, it, it's a gray area. And then the other column is what really you could delegate or you absolutely don't have to do, or you literally could push it off. And I think when it's all up in our head, it's a jumble, <laughs> excuse me. But when we write it down and we itemize it, you've got a visual right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. It helps again to reduce some of that feeling of overwhelm and, and confusion and, and just clutter. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like it's clutter of the brain. It <laughs> is. And I think that's such a key method, writing things down <clears throat> to help us get past that sense of overwhelm. I would love for you to share um, one or two examples of success stories you've had with your clients when you've worked with somebody. What was the issue that either they, they thought they needed to work on or you identified as needing, you needed to help them with, what was it they, what are some of the things they did or you did with them? And then what was the outcome? How, do, how were things better for them? Well, the, at a very you know simple level that somebody that was feeling very overwhelmed by all her work schedule and we did that practice of, you know, look at your, your <coughs> emails, can you, you know, itemize them. Can you create um, uh, folders for them? Uh, all, all those things that we just talked about. And she said it made such a difference. She said, I can't believe how much of a difference it actually made. It was great. Um, I have a client who is a young, young, much younger client um, than many of them. And he's just, he's delightful. Um, because he does the work and he does it so well. And he, he sends me, you know, I send him a sort of in-between session check-in. So how, how are you feeling right this moment? What's worked well for you? What hasn't worked well? And it's so detailed. It's amazing. Mm. And he, I mean, basically, he said, I was helping him more on the personal level, doing some of these practices we just talked about. And he came from a place of, you know, he was kind of depressed, actually, and very, uh, especially with, the, with COVID, and, and feeling um, isolated, lost, confused, various, you know, all the words, you can, adjectives you could use to describe him. And we started working on some of these practices. And um, he said it was transformative. He said, I, I can't believe how much better I feel. I'm, and now he's out and he's, he's met somebody and they have a, a relationship that's blooming. And he said, it's, he said, this has really changed my life. And um, it, now he said, I'm going to apply some of these same principles to, to my work. You know, so peeling back the layers, you, all the things that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And, and um, sometimes you know, a lot of what we do is very, it seems very simple. I'm sure you find the same thing. It's like, well, that's pretty obvious, but you know what? We don't see it for ourselves often. Mm -hmm. We need somebody else to hold that mirror up and yeah. say, well, have you tried this? Have you thought about that? I don't tell people what to do. I just ask questions. I can make suggestions. Um, and, and somebody uh, who was about approaching retirement, and he's a very, very, very private person. He grew up in a family that never expressed themselves. And he doesn't share much with his spouse. He does, you know, he's, he's always worked hard. He's been good at his work, but he had no idea what retirement was going to look like. And I think he was pretty afraid of it. And um, we, I just gradually started talking about some of these things as I am with you. I suggested a vision board, but I said, because he'd never done anything like that before, I said, start thinking about some of the things you enjoy doing or what did you used to enjoy doing when you were younger? You know, what are some of the things that you would put on that list of, this is what I'd love to do when I'm retired. Start thinking about it, start creating, vision a whole new future for yourself. This isn't the end of a chapter. Yes, in certain, yeah, okay, it's an end of a chapter, but don't look at it as just the end of something, but as the beginning of something. And his wife, um, 
actually came to me. I'm coaching with her a bit now too, because she was so thrilled at how he started opening up and, and started doing things and talking with her. So it's uh, like amazing, simple things really. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what it sounds like, Fran, you're really a master of asking questions that get people to think about what yeah. if, you know, yeah. and, right. and so you're inviting them. Like you said, you don't tell, which of course a good coach isn't sitting there telling, but you're asking questions that get them to think. And I think that that is such a valuable um, tool, asking the right kinds of questions, sensing who they are, where they are, what they need to draw out, uh, to pull them away from where they might be stuck. Yeah, th- thank you for that. Yes, it's interesting to, to have your input on that. One of the things that I, I think I've discovered fairly recently is that I'm really good at asking, apparently. Um, so maybe it's tied to the same thing. Um, I, I've never been afraid to ask for what I want. And, or rarely, I'm not going to say never. Um, and where does that come from? I don't really know. Um, I just think that I've always told myself, what's the worst that could happen? Somebody says no, right? So I'm talking about asking for, uh-huh. in creating. So sometimes we sit on the sidelines waiting to be invited. I don't think you're going to get too far with that. Uh-huh. You know, especially in my work, I, unless you're screaming from the rooftops of social media, which I just don't appreciate or enjoy, you know, how does anybody know about you if, if you don't ask? I asked, I asked you if I could come on your show. Uh-huh. Right? I didn't wait for you to invite me because you would never have known who I was. Uh-huh. Well, and I think that is a really important point we can kind of wrap up with because I love that you ask. And I think it's such a good example, again, of getting past whatever internal stories we might be telling ourselves about, oh, I might be bothering them or they, you know, they might say no. Well, so what? You know, they've already said no in a sense because you haven't asked, (laughs) right? And also, I think a lot of the, the universe does conspire when we know what we want and when we ask for it, there is an energy out there. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, people want, I think people want to help you if you ask. Mm-hmm. They really do. What do you think is different about you compared to what might be going on in someone else's mind that's more hesitant to ask? What's, what's a differentiator that maybe you could use as an encouragement to my listeners who are maybe more reticent about asking others i think it comes back to the fear thing again i i I don't want to trouble somebody i'm afraid that they'll say no well or or here's a a little mantra that i love and i use a lot and i may have mentioned it to you before what you think and say about me is none of my business because most of the time it isn't somebody it's not about you get your ego out of it so how terrible it would be if you asked for a favor or you asked somebody you know um whatever that that ask is and they say no it doesn't necessarily mean it's anything wrong with you it's just simply that it doesn't work for them Uh so i i think those are the things that the blocks is if you can get past that you can get your ego out of it and just simply state clearly and and pleasantly this is what i would like to see happen is this something that we could do and they say no but more often they'll say yes and you're usually not troubling people because i think a lot of people do want to feel that they've helped somebody Mm -hmm. they've contributed Mm -hmm. i think that's such an important point that if we go in with the spirit of you know the reason I'm asking is I sincerely believe what I'm asking for will be of help to you, Mm -hmm. not just to me. I'm not just trying to get or take, I'm interested in being of service to you too. Then to me, it helps you relax into the asking. Really good point, Meredith, because when I think about the number of things that, that over the years that I have asked for, 
yeah, I'd say pretty much most of the time they've been a benefit to the other person in some form or another. Mm -hmm. But I also think it comes because I don't live my life from a place of fear. I never have. It's not that I do stupid things, you know, rat, you know, reckless. I don't live recklessly, but I just, um, I don't worry a lot about, you know, how, how can I explain? I, I think the best way to just say it is I don't come from, a, I don't live from a place of fear. Uh -huh. I live from a place of um, joy might be a bit strong. I mean, there are moments of joy. It's not all the time, obviously, but um, hope and expectation and that, that, um, that we're all here to paint a picture for our lives. And it's why not paint the best picture you can paint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm listening to you, one of the key things that, that's coming to my mind is the mantra you just said about what other people think of me is none of my business. Another way of saying that is I'm going to say what I need to say, no matter what the other person's reaction might be, because you, it's not about you in, in the way you think about it. I think too often we hold back because we're concerned we're going to hear something we don't like, or the other person is going to respond negatively. And then we take that as an evaluation of ourselves mm -hmm. as an individual of our value and our worth. And so it ties back in to that imposter syndrome you mentioned earlier, where we don't feel worthy. And so if somebody says no, that just reinforces the belief yeah. that we had and makes us more fearful, more hesitant to ask. So I love your approach of not being worried about what the answer is going to be, but just stepping up and putting that request out there mm -hmm. yeah. to see what happens. Yeah. I think you're thinking too, it's almost like you're thinking too far ahead. If you're worrying about what their answer will be, just, just think about what it is you want to create or, or ask for and put it out there and see what mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. I love that. What would I like to create mm -hmm. and what's necessary in order to do that? That's a great note to end on. Fran, were there any other points you would like to share with my listeners that I haven't asked you about that were especially on your mind today? I, I thank you for that. Um, I'll probably think of half a dozen when we get off. <laughs> so um, no, we've covered some really important points and um, I, I can't think of anything that comes to mind right now. I, I do think that some of the things that I'm finding now are definitely related to age. Not everything, but I feel at this point in my life that I am uh, at a better place mentally than, than I've ever been. And that feels really good. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits, um, if you allow it to be aging, if you don't get stuck in that mindset, because I, I'm passionate about the whole philosophy on ageism and, you know, being a modern elder, you know, um, it's, it's really important that we can contribute and get past this idea that you've got to fade off into the sun. Uh -huh. sun you know? We still got a lot to offer. Yes. I think as we get older, we have even more because we've learned so much <laughs> from our mistakes yeah, and it, life's it, experiences. Right. Experiences so. and, and I think emotional intelligence is, uh. is for many people more developed more. Uh -huh. and so, yeah. That's great. Well, Fran, how can people connect with you, learn more about the services that you offer and just, just um, exactly. where can they find I you? Love, I love connecting. So, um, you know, whether that, whether we go anywhere with that or not connecting is great. I love to share. Um, so I don't sell my services in that sense at all. I just, you know, work through supporting people and sharing information. So LinkedIn is a good place to find me, uh, uh, you know, Fran Keo um, on LinkedIn. Uh, my website, which is, again, is really simple, frankeo.com, as long as you get the key, Keo spelling right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> K-E-O-G-H. Yes, K-E-O-G-H. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my email, which is fran at frankeo.com. 
Um, so, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Fran, for being with me today. I love that you asked. Mm -hmm. I love that we had this wonderful conversation and I appreciate the presence and mindfulness that you bring to the world and that you share with everyone who knows you. And I, I likewise with you, I think you're doing wonderful work out in the world. So it's, I'm so um, pleased to be uh, on your, on your show today. And one other thing I could say, um, People can, I'm happy to give my uh, PDF, the six, six step guide to um, uh, most of life's messiest questions and they can sign up for that and get that. I can send it. And I also have a guided meditation um, MP3 that I created is um, uh, that it's free of, you know, something uh, I, I'm happy to share with people. Oh, great. So they can request that if they go to your website. Yeah, or an email. Yeah, right. Wonderful. Um, Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Fran. You're very welcome. Have a great rest of week. Thanks for tuning into my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.